Okay. So we're going to go into our books today. If you got your book nearby, and we're in the uh, Electrical Studies for Trades book, and we're going to turn to page 76 of the Electrical Studies for Trades, and we're going to talk a little bit about static charges and electrostatic fields and lightning, and then we're going to go into uh, start into magnetism. So if you notice in that first paragraph, as far as static charges are concerned, static electrical charges are a common occurrence in everyday life. Almost everyone has received a shock after walking up across a carpet and then touching a metal object or sliding across seat covers in a car and touching a door handle. I'm pretty sure everybody's experienced that at least once, right? Nobody has, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it happens, rub your feet on the floor on the carpet and then touch the TV or something like that and you're gonna get an electric shock. Well, how does this, uh, what's going on in this process? Pretty much through the chapter uh, that, that talks about it, you are bringing yourself either, either to, now remember this, this is DC electricity. You are bringing yourself either to a positive charge or a negative charge that's higher than whatever you're touching. Hey, thank you, Robbie. <laughs> Not completely about it. So we're going to stop there and get back into it. I forgot completely about Mr. Hopkins safety meeting. So Jesse. Hey, hey Jesse. Ooh. Yep. Okay. I was muted. I got you. I'm sorry about that. Let me share my screen here and get your business going. Hold on one second. X that out. Let's that's a full screen. This screen over to that screen. Let's get your email opened up. JD Hopkins. FR clothing, excellent. Sounds like a perfect subject. All right, Jesse, when this thing comes up, you can just tell me when to advance, okay? All right. That sounds so happy. I'm good. Wow. Warp factor speed here. Okay, I'm ready to roll. All right, so chose to do mine on FR clothing, and if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, okay, what is that right in there? What does FR stand for? Uh, flame resistant. Let's see, Terry. No one. And where'd you get flame resistant from? Uh, that's so the manufacturers, but it's flame resistant um, rather than flame retardant. Uh, and I had it bullet on the next slide, but um, it's going to resist flame rather than quickly extinguish itself. Um, but it can burn short term, um, but it's going to be pretty quickly to extinguish it. Uh, your main thing in our field is protecting against arc flash. Um, if you get it on you, it'll, it's not going to completely stop you from getting burned, but it's going to help protect you better than your typical clothes as it, once you get out of the, I guess, out of the arc flash, once that fire goes out, once the ignition source goes out, you will, um, 
go quickly extinguish rather than your clothes continuing to burn and melt to you. It's not something that's going to melt to you and keep burning. Um, it really helps protect us against getting yourself uh, burned the more percentage of your body from getting burned um, than if you had arms exposed, face exposed, all that. Um, but also from keeping your legs and everything like that too, from getting burned, the less percent of your body that's burned, the better your chances of survival are going to be. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, uh, when I asked you on the FR part, you, you'll hear plenty of people say uh, flame resistant, fire retardant, uh, fire resistant, all, all those pertain to the same thing. Right. Ready for next gotcha. one? Yep, ready for the next one. And just some quick statistics on this. Uh, more than 2,000 people annually are admitted to burn, senior, burn centers due to arc flash burns. So obviously by having your FR clothing with something that's a common danger to the job, you protect yourself a lot better and reduce the severity of them giving yourself a better chance and every day in the United States arc flash sends a victim to a burn center so it's not something that you know is very rare it's a fairly common occurrence that you want to be protected against right it's kind of a head scratcher and Robbie help me out here if you've heard any news or information on this also electrical linemen this is an OSHA requirement right for you to be wearing yep. FR clothing and FR gear on the electrician side um, from what I've read and understood before, only if you're working on 480 volts and above is OSHA requiring electricians to wear fire retardant clothing. And even at that, uh, I know I've seen plenty of them even today that are still not wearing fire retardant cl clothing uh, at those voltage levels. So it's kind of a uh, it's, what I was trying to get to is here is in the electrical industry, it's real strict, yeah. I mean, very strict, that uh, you're wearing FR clothing around voltages, whereas the electrician side of it is kind of uh, lax. Yeah, uh, that is a, that is a surprising statistic right there. Two thousand. Uh, I didn't know that statistic. That's very good information. Next slide. I found that one. I thought it was kind of interesting. But yeah, on the next slide, I have a couple of videos there. Okay. Um, go into a little detail. You see which screen that's gonna come up on? Yes, sir, it works. Let's take a look at why flame resistant or FR clothing matters. If someone is accidentally exposed to a short duration, high temperature event, like a flash fire or an electric arc flash, their non-FR clothing could easily ignite and burn. If this happens, the amount and severity of the burn injury could actually be more significant than what would have been caused by the event itself. The recovery time could be very long and painful, and the chances of surviving drop dramatically. Here is a chart developed from data collected by the American Burn Association. The vertical bars show the survival rate percentages for different age groups based on the amount of burn injury. The blue bar represents a body burn injury area of 25%, and you can see that all age groups have a very high rate of survival. The purple bar represents a burn area of 50%, and although the survival rate has dropped, even the older individuals have close to a 50-50 chance of survival, while the younger group has up to an 80% chance. However, when we get to the yellow bar that represents a burn injury area of 75%, only the youngest people have a chance of survival above 50%, and the oldest group has only a 10% chance. Fortunately, flame-resistant clothing can help provide protection in the event of accidental arc flash or flash fire exposure. That's the matrix. And continue uh. to burn. Plus, it can also provide a degree of additional escape time in the aftermath of a flash fire. Jordan, All that PPE and he's got no goggles. Watch FR clothing. Cap all 22. That represents a burn. And what was that? Said all that PPE and he's got no goggles. Uh, goggles are not required. 
kind of strange, isn't it? Eye protection. You're supposed to have eye protection. Glasses are required, but goggles are not required. And I just want to speak on this uh, one chart here for just a moment. As far as when he gets down to the 75% portion of a, of a body burn, physically, why is the survival rate so low? You can burn. I mean, what's happened to the body? I mean, pretty much your whole entire body's charred at that point. Well, it, immune it, system's it, going to go into shock. It's a severe deep burn, and what's going on here, of course, is the risk of infection. And your kidneys are not able to keep up supplying the amount. Your body goes into overload trying to uh, keep your body wet and nourished as far as hydration. And your kidneys go into overload, and usually your kidneys shut down trying to accommodate for the uh, burn area and trying to cure the burn area. So that's that's typically what happens there. But that is a good chart. Why, why are older people more susceptible? Uh, weaker immune systems, maybe? The immune system, no, but this is kind of weird. Robbie, Robbie and I know about it because we're old. Your skin becomes thinner. Yeah. Yeah, your outer... Uh, your outer epidermis becomes thinner, and you, you'll see a lot of old people that kind of bump themselves, and they get that uh, bruise and, and you know red spots in their arms. That's because their uh, skin is so much thinner. Right. That's a good video. Let me get back to the. And you had another one, correct? Um. Yeah, I think it actually might be the top right one right there. If it's part two. Here. If that's part two, that was gonna be the next video. Let me see. The same. If it goes into part two. Now, FR clothing, clothing basics, part two. There you go. Yep. <clears throat> FR clothing basics, part two. How FR clothing protects workers. In FR clothing basics, part one. We learned that non-FR clothing can ignite and burn when exposed to flash fire or electric arc flash, increasing the wearer's risk of severe burn injuries. Flame-resistant clothing, on the other hand, is made with special fabrics and components that have been developed to not ignite and continue to burn after being exposed to these short-duration thermal accidents. <laughs> Here's a video clip of an arc flash. On the left, we have regular clothes, and on the right, FR clothing. You can see how the FR garments quickly self-extinguish. I'd rather be the person on the right. FR clothing helps provide protection in the event of accidental arc flash or flash fire exposure, and it can also provide a degree of additional escape time in the aftermath of a flash fire. But most importantly, by not continuing to burn, FR clothing greatly reduces the amount and severity of a burn injury which helps improve the chances of survival. Note, however, that FR clothing is not designed to be worn alone for structural or other firefighting activities and does not protect against continuous thermal exposure, hot liquids, steam, or chemicals. It can continue to burn after being exposed to these short duration thermal We have regular- One thing I want you guys to recognize here and uh what the left was the uh, regular clothes and right is the FR clothing, mm -hmm. is how fast this electrical flash occurs. Watch this. The clothes, and on the right, F. That's it. So you're looking at a second, sometimes even less, of, of the uh, flash event. FR clothing. You can and then the, the guy on the left-hand side is already on fire and burning up in that process, where the other one is extinguished. As far as electrical flashes and arc flashes are concerned, they are very, very quick. But guess right. what the hottest thing on the planet Earth is? Take lightning? A huh? Shouldn't it be like lightning? No. No. Oh, no, like the Earth's core or something? No. Magma? Magma. Oh, <laughs> the arc flash? The arc flash is actually three times hotter than the sun. An electrical arc flash is the hottest thing that's ever generated on planet Earth. So and that, just by the speed of what that happened right there, we'll show you just how fast something can ignite when it's not flame retardant. OK, 
Yeah, good, good video. There. And we'll definitely get more into FR clothing. Was there a question? Uh, while, while we got it up here, are there any further questions uh, or you want to continue with your uh, PowerPoint, don't you? Sir? You want to continue with your PowerPoint here? That was the last slide. Um, the main takeaways I had from this, though, was mainly, you know, it's it's a short duration event. It's not something that's going to totally eliminate you from getting burned, but greatly reduce how much your body should be burned and how severe it's going to be. Yeah, agree 100%. I've seen FR clothing in action. I've seen it work. Uh, you'll notice in the videos that you saw some employees out there that had FR jeans that they are. Yeah, out there, and the FR jeans actually themselves, I will tell you, in the summertime, they're hot, but they are required. They offer a very high amount of protection as far as FR clothing is concerned. Yeah, there are some other spots in the videos out there and other things that I saw that you need to look out for too. Uh, I saw one guy wearing a watch. Can you wear a watch while you're working in a line? No. No. I'd say no jewelry at all, right? No jewelry at all. Um, the earrings got to come out. The necklace has got to come off. Yeah. The watch has got to come off. You'll see a lot of linemen that have moved to uh, plastic belt buckles yeah. in that situation. Anything that's metallic, uh, no wire rim glasses, anything that's metallic on your body when that flash event occurs is going to soak up is it's really going to magnetize and bring in and intensify that heat and uh typically i've from the ones i've seen in the videos and whatnot you'll see watches in, embedded into arms or glasses glasses on a flash event that usually would have just given the guy you know a hard sunburn and maybe burned off his eyebrows well the wire rim glasses are melted into the side of their heads so uh anything metallic on your body is, is not recommended Right. Recommend it's not allowed. Yeah. Uh, let me just make one comment about it, if you don't mind. Um, you know, it's real easy, especially when you reach the classification where you can go out to a call at night and it's so easy just to, you know, slip on a t shirt, run out the door and do it. But you really need to think about safety all the way around and do the right thing. I mean, you're you're pretty much working by yourself when you're on call and you, you just need to do the right thing. Like I said, suit up with, you know, your clothes that your company's bought you, your FR, because it's there for a reason. It's for your safety. Make sure you, you know, you're accountable for your own actions. That That's plain and simple. Um, if anybody's ever been to the burn center up there in Augusta, um, I had, I went there cause one of my coworkers got burnt and, um, it's not a real happy place to be watching all those folks that's in their burns, especially with electrical burns. And they do come in right regular on a helicopter at the, in Augusta. So save yourself a lot of pain, heartache, and your family because that puts them through it as well. Wear your FR clothing, um, everything. Mm -hmm. Protect yourself and protect others. Yeah, that, that's a great comment, uh, Robbie. And I don't know if I've said this class before. I think I probably have. You know, I was uh, 20 when I was electrocuted uh, with 7,200 volts. As far as the contact area, the three contact areas on my leg, uh, I've got three circles there that have, uh, they're about two inches around, that that skin was completely destroyed, had to come off, two on my thigh and one on my hip. But if you look outside at the full, thigh area and the full hip area, the flash covered more area than the actual burn. So all of that is, uh, I mean, not, I think we've said this before, electrocutions are, are not common. They're uncommon. Flashes and flash injuries are more common. Uh, I know we're kind of sticking on the subject, but it is a very important one. Uh, is your hard hat fire retardant? No, it's just impact resistant, right? No, if you get a Z87.1, a hard hat is FR rated. Is uh, what about the Z87.1 safety glasses? Yeah, they are. They are fire retardant. You got to look out here. There's some that have uh, more 
capability of protecting your eyes as far as the flash light is concerned, but they are fire retardant also. So what you'll have out there in, in the world is, well, I'm gonna come into work, I'm gonna have my FR clothing on, and guess what I'm wearing under it? Shirt. See it all the time. What's Under Armour shirts made out of? Yeah. Anybody know? Mm, polyester. Almost pure polyester. <laughs> will ignite in a second. So you got your collar, you got your, you know, you're buttoned up to here and you got a piece of t-shirt that's hanging through here and a flash occurs, that, that will ignite and melt into your skin. Actually, the heat is so intense that it can go through your shirt and melt the polyester shirt underneath it. So uh, what's, what's the best underwear and socks to wear as far as fire retardant is concerned? Tidy whities Tidy whities 100% cotton. 100% cotton will uh, is to apt not to ignite. Okay. Well, good video and good uh, explanation there, uh, Mr. Hopkins. Appreciate the fine job with that. All right. Thank you. Back to uh, static electricity and innate. Uh, we're on page uh, 78. We know what static electricity is. It's just a difference in the positive and negative charge of one object to another object. That object could be you or anything that's either positive or negatively charged. And we'll talk about lightning a little bit here for static electricity in nature. And if you look on page 79, you see that drawing that's up on page 79? You've got clouds that are either positive or negatively charged. And you've got the earth which is either positive or negatively charged. And the way you would think that the sky would be positive, right? And the ground would be what? Negative. Negative. Well, it doesn't always occur in that. And what they're kind of leaving out of that picture there is that if you have that tree that's standing there and that tree is made of wood, so it's got some good insulation to it and airflow goes across that tree it'll actually positively charge that tree and the cloud at a negative charge. And what's really trying to happen right there in that instance is finally they become so either positive or negatively charged differentially. The two are so different that they'll want to bridge the gap and, and lightning will occur. Now I talk with this on every class because I usually have a lot of customers asking about this. Uh, who's seen a house that has lightning rods on it? Oh, yeah. I have. I have. I have. Yeah, there's plenty of them out there. Now, a customer is going to come up to an ASCII and say, well, uh, and this is, this is up for a talk and opinion, and it is kind of an opinion-like thing. Would you want to put lightning arresters, not lightning arresters, lightning rods on your house or not? I'd say no. I mean, the lightning is coming from the ground up, right? Uh, it goes both directions. You have cloud to ground and ground to cloud lightning uh, events. Uh, it cloud to ground are the most common. It depends on because I know when I lived in Pennsylvania for a lot of years, uh, there's a lot of mountains and everything. If you were up over higher than something, then they would, you know, recommend that you install uh, lightning arresters on your house. But down here, flat, lightning, I don't lightning know. arresters or lightning rods. Rods. They would have them on old barns and everything. Yeah, your, your video, um, excuse me, your audio is kind of junk. I don't know what happened there, but I got understood what you said. It, it's out for debate, gentlemen. If somebody asks you, well, should I install lightning uh, rods in my house? Uh, what do lightning rods do? It attracts lightning, right? It attracts lightning. So you're actually making the possibility of a lightning strike to your house more capable. Now, if you've got a good grounded lightning rod system that goes to the rod and goes straight to ground, you, you, you'd be okay, hopefully. But remember, there's resistance in everything. So it, it's kind of out, like I say, it's out for debate. I've seen some people uh, that have had lightning rods in their house and they'll come back to me uh, with uh, power outage calls or they got damages in their house. They'll call me out and say, uh, you know, I got lightning struck. It, lightning strikes and they're looking like this picture right here. They got some trees around and whatnot. Well, lightning struck my house again, lightning struck my house again. And it's just a common occurrence all the time. And I would recommend taking the lightning rods off. Mm -hmm. 
and let the trees and the rest of nature do its thing. So uh, if you ever have a customer ask you in that situation, well, what should I do? Should I use them or not? That's really up to them. I myself do not use them. I myself do not believe in them. I don't want to bring lightning to my house. Yeah. Okay. So the rest of it goes into uh, lightning protection and the, the page 80 does talk about what you can do. Lightning rods are sometimes used to help protect objects from lightning. It doesn't protect an object from lightning. It attracts lightning. And the two uh, differences in the cloud to ground and ground to cloud and cloud to cloud lightning events. Like I said before, the most common is cloud to ground lightning event. All right. All right, so another, if you look at the second paragraph there, another device used for lightning protection is the lightning arrester. The lightning arrester works very similarly to the lightning rod. It, it, it sort of, except that it's not designed to be struck by lightning itself or does it? It does not provide a direct path to ground. There's some uh, wording in there that goes a little bit wrong. So let me do, uh, let me bring this up for you. Fix that one. So you're looking at a typical, now this is a large size, there is no audio to this, a typical large size lightning arrester. Okay, and it just goes through the uh, video through here and shows you the different parts and whatnot. Let me get down to here. And pause it. All right, so there's a lot of things going on inside a lightning arrester. And if you've seen the ones that are attached to our uh, switches that we use out in the field, we have one energized side. So we're taking the riser off the primary and we're going into the rester then we're going into the switch, then we're going into the transformer. What do we do with the other side? What do we connect it to? Ground. Ground, okay. So all day long, and what th this is the actual insulation material, all day long they just they sit there and uh, just do nothing all day long, and they have a rating to them depending on the voltage that you're installing them on. So the arresters that we have in the switch out there in the field are, 8.1 kV arresters. So what do I mean by 8.1 kV? Eight thousand one hundred. Right. They're rated to eight thousand one hundred volts. They're used on a seventy-two hundred volt system. So if I have seven thousand two hundred volts coming in, connecting here, then going down to my switch and the other side is grounded, everything's copacetic and fine and dandy. Once I go over 8,100 volts, what happens? The rest of that voltage gets brought into the power line? Actually, all of the voltage, that's a good answer right there. Actually, all of it does. Once it goes over the uh, rating of the arrestor, the 8,100 volts, a new path is formed, and that new path is guessed to where? Ground. Ground. The new path is ground. I, I kind of, I mean, you'll never see a name change as far as what they're called. It's a lightning arrester. And when I think of the word lightning arrester, that means I'm taking a lightning strike, I'm bringing it to a point, and I'm completely stopping it. That's not really what's happening here in a lightning arrester. A lightning arrestor redirects all the voltage to ground. Okay, be prepared for a question like that to come up of how a lightning arrestor works. And I'll, like I said, I'm videoing, uh, excuse me, uh, recording this, so you'll be able to look at this later. So to top it off here. Lightning arresters have a rating, and for my example, this lightning arrestor is 8.1 kV. My operating voltage is 7,200. Once I have exceeded 8.1 kV, a new path is formed to ground. And all that voltage from the lightning strike 
will go to ground. How much voltage is in a lightning strike? Didn't you say it was like million? Yeah, you can go up to the million volts. It's a DC electric strike, but it still has damages to it. So uh, yeah, those can go up into the millions of volts. They are very fast. What you're doing here in the lightning arrestor makeup is I'm making it go to ground and it no longer goes through my switch. So whatever I've got my switch attached to over here, transformer, tap line, whatever, now it's not seeing any voltage at all. Have you ever uh, seen a thunderstorm come along and there's different reasons for this and a lightning strike happens and your lights go on and off real quick? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of two things happen, either a breaker in a substation is operating or all the voltage that was on the line before that fed your house momentarily went to ground and then just came back up to normal. So any questions there on the, on the lightning arrestor and how a lightning arrestor works? Does anybody know what MOV stands for? I would take that as an now. <clears throat> Metal oxide varistor. And that's really just the component that is uh, it's just a huge resistor until it reaches a certain voltage. Okay, what time are we holding here? 9.38, we got a little bit more time before we take a break. All right, so any any questions there on electro, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, lightning arresters? You said MOV stands for what? Metal oxide? Metal oxide varistor, variable resistor, metal oxide. And really, All right. If you're out there in the world, it's like a huge heat variable resistor. It's just, that's all it is. I resist up to 8,100 volts, and after 8,100 volts, I become a conductor. Watch this video here real quick. Go back to the beginning. Maybe this will be you one day. Maybe not. Hey, is what my cousin does. Yeah, I put my seatbelt on too. There's the deer stand. We're going to be catching a deer out there today.
Okay. So I'm gonna go slow-mo here, and I don't know if you guys heard it or saw it, but did you see that electrical arc that came out of the uh, uh, conductor when he put the wand to it? Yeah, wasn't he just bringing himself up to the same conductivity as the line? He's bringing up himself up to the same potential. That is correct. There is a difference in potential voltage-wise. Okay, you gotta think of voltage in this situation between the helicopter and the lineman that's inside. So first things first here. When he first got in the helicopter, he is in a suit that is uh, has wire mesh in it from head to toe with a hood on. So he has wire mesh over his entire body and he is uh, sitting on the plate. There's an aluminum plate that he's sitting on. So him and the helicopter and the pilot are all at one potential. The wire is not. So let me change this here real quick. All right, so you saw the arcing and everything that was going on with the conductor out there, correct? Yeah. Okay. In, in this photograph, I mean, in this video, what you're watching right here is when he's taking the wand, you don't want to go into here and put your hand directly to the conductor because that electrostatic charge, if you've ever been snapped by one that's in your vehicle and you see how small that is, that, that's a really minute one. This one will, it will not kill you but it will chatter your teeth very hard and it will make you feel very bad real quick. It, it, it'll be painful to the touch. So instead of bringing the helicopter and the conductor to the same uh, potential, what does he use to make the initial contact? What's in his hand right here? The wand. Right, the wand has a cable to it. There's a wooden handle. The wand has a cable to it, and that cable is going over to the helicopter. So that makes the initial contact. Now he puts on what? Carabiner. Well, that's just like a regular, I mean, it's, it's made for alignment, but it, it's a clamp. It's just like a regular battery clamp. It's still connected to the helicopter, but that's his, I wanna say permanent, that's a solution to be able to sit there for a while and be able to use both hands. He, he's not, he's be able to take the wand away now. The wand is still making contact. Now he's making a new semi-permanent contact right here. So the helicopter and the conductor same, stay at the same potential. Now you, you saw the arc, it actually started arcing before he put the wand on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it did, it did. Yeah. That's the electrostatic, electrostatic field that's being given off by the conductor because we are working on a voltage of what? 765,000 volts on the line. That voltage is so high that it, it is actually trying to escape the conductor. We have a real high positive charge on the conductor and the voltage is so high that it's actually trying to escape out into the air. Remember gentlemen, Air conducts electricity. So, especially up at these voltages. So, certain amount of electrostatic energy is trying to escape this conductor all the time until eventually, well, I've got so much air here, I just, there's just nowhere to go. But around the conductor, depending on the voltage, please remember we're talking voltage here, there's an electrostatic field, all right? He breaks the field with the wand, he goes permanent, semi-permanent for when he has to do his work with the uh, clamp right here. Let's continue. I'll go uh, regular speed.
So he and the helicopter at this time, uh, how many volts are on him? More than the 700. 765,000, right? right? Right now, he is at a voltage of 765,000 volts. All right. And the helicopter is at 765,000. And the conductor, why is he not getting electrocuted? Because there's no path to ground. Yeah, there's no path for that electricity to go. He's just sitting out in open air. He just added himself to the circuit without being grounded, right? Correct. He is actually a part of the conductor right now. Uh, it's When you start getting up in these voltages, how many birds do you see on the line? None. Yeah, you won't see birds on a line at these voltages because that electrostatic field is so high. Once a bird comes close to contact with it, they'll actually feel it and they'll just shy away from this line. Why won't ducks line, uh, land on this line? Come on, duck hunters. Those dogs don't sit on power lines? Uh, well, duck, a duck has web. Duck has web feet. I would say a duck can't sit on a power line. There you, you go. Mean, Good, yeah. call. Good call. Good <laughs> call. So he can make any kind of contact that he wants to with it. The gloves, the sleeves, everything are here have metal are metal lined. They have uh, metal fibers in them. So he's he's got to keep his potential from his hands to his feet and the helicopter all at one same potential. I had a question, Chief. What's up there, Indian? How is he touching more than one line at a time? All right, let me get. Uh, let me see if I can get a good picture of it. All right. Because he's right. attached himself to one line. All right. So this is what they call, gentlemen, this is what they call, and you'll see this is getting more and more regular out there in the world. There's three sets of four, and it's kind of hard to see off here in the distance. This is actually one phase. Oh, uh, that makes sense. That's why I said it was more than 765 when you touched the other line. What was that again? When you asked uh, what his voltage was, I, told, I said it was more than 765. I figured those were all individual phases. No, no. This is all, and what that, it's called bundle conductor. And what they've done is they've come out of the uh, switch yard, and instead of pulling one wire for A phase, they pulled four wires for A phase. And really in a build, when you're doing transmission, this is how it's gonna be out there in the world. Uh, depending on how much load you've got in your circuit, in 2020, we might just pull two. Two for A, two for B, and two for C. And if the load increases, all we have to do is pull in one more new conductor, make it three. Four is the typical highest in this situation. So this is actually all just A phase. Uh, one set over here is all B phase, and one set over here is all C phase. So he's working on one singular phase. So the combination of those four is 765? No, this is 765 by itself. Then uh, the combination of four over here is 765 by itself. Then the combination of four over here is 765 by itself. So what is it phase to phase? Ooh, 765 times what? Uh, 1.7325. There you go. That'll give you your total voltage face to face. I can guarantee you now the helicopter pilot is, and this is built this way. Uh, well, who makes the most money? Uh, the lineman? No, 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 no. I can guarantee you the lineman's going to be making six digits plus. That helicopter pilot's probably going to make double what he's making. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff my cousin does, and I've seen his pay stuff. It's nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody understand one thing, the things I want to get across here is, is there an electrostatic field around this conductor, each conductor and the whole bundle? Yes. All yes. right. Uh, what determines the size of the electrostatic field? The voltage. The amount of voltage that's on it, correct. Okay. 
and a bundle conductor. I can make this, this, all four of these conductors make up one phase. Uh, <coughs> before, you know, we're only able to get a certain amount onto a reel and pull it, pull it a distance. So if I have additional load come on, well, I just add another one, add another one, add another one. Typically, these conductors will go up to 900, excuse me, 900 amps on that conductor size from the way I can determine. So you got, if one phase was here, I mean, if one wire was here, that'd be 900, 1800, uh, 20, 2700. Now I'm able to carry 3600 amps on one phase. Okay, let's take a break. 10 minutes. All right. All right. Oh, fuck them. Oh, I stole them. Stole them. Oh. <laughs>
Okay, so before uh, we get started back here, uh, any questions so far? Nobody wants to become a helicopter lineman? I do. How do you do that? You do. You do. Okay, he does. So, I mean, probably about, ooh, I'd say about 15 years ago, uh, Safety Cooper did have its own helicopter. Yeah, it did have its own lineman. I was trained in it and did it for a little bit just because they like to do cross training in it. But most of your helicopter work nowadays is done through contract services, uh, just so you don't have to have a helicopter and it's a lot cheaper to do that. Uh, you'll have to be a transmission A lineman that typically, typically takes in a company or, or this contract company four to five years. And then you're going to have another about four years of training in actual helicopter lineman work, live line work. And then you could become a helicopter lineman. I mean, the, the good saying out there in the world is what's the difference between distribution utilities and transmission utilities? Transmission is bigger. That, that's about it. So uh, it, it takes a good bit of training. Uh, there's a lot of, I want to say a lot of, depending on the company you get with, very few companies do uh, their own helicopter work anymore. So if I'm a contractor, I'll usually work for maybe like Pacific Gas and Electric for two, three, four, five months, depending on the amount of work that they've got. Then I might have to go to Texas. And then I might have to go to, uh, you know, just travel around to where I'm working contracts for different utilities. It's a pretty cool job. Pays good. Everybody mm -hmm. know what a per diem is? Free money. Yeah. <laughs> all these contract companies that do this type of work, they work on a per diem, so they're going to take care of all your travel expenses, uh, take care of all your fuel. Uh, typically, you're going to have a pickup or something to drive. Take uh, take all care of all your living and you know, usually a hotel or something like that, and pretty much you're going to get free money. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay, so let me get out of this one. That was a uh, helicopter live line work. Fix that one. Go on to company my cousin works for. They had him up in New York for almost a year straight. He wanted up just renting a house. Yeah. Uh, why is this not going full screen? I don't know. There it goes. All right. So this is this is actually a de-energized transmission, and this is a three bundle conductor. So instead of four, like you saw before, there's just three in this bundle. And instead of using the helicopter, this line is de-energized for him to work on it. 
He uses a cart. Who was asking before, well, how do you get out there to be able to do the work? Is that there? Yeah. That's we climbed across the steel and be able to get down to the conductor. What's he using here? The ladder. Yep, he's using a fiber ladder. Fiber ladder. Fiber ladder. Then pretty much from there on, he, everything that he's got here, well, that's an old safety. So he's got a full body harness on. He's clipped into the conductor here. And everything's forced to tune from the ground. I'll, I'll go out here a little bit further because it takes a lot of time for prep. So they send him up a cart. He attaches the cart to the line, plus the safety chain. Ooh, that's tight. Go ahead and jump on in. Hear that, hear that conductor sing? It's tight. All right, then he gives the guy the signal. Let's drive on. So the guy on the ground is just driving the truck. There he goes. So he's going to go down here and change the spacer out. A little windy. So that's another method of being able to get up there and uh, do work on transmission lines. Of course, in this situation, it's got to be de-energized. When you start using a cart, that's got to be de-energized. Okay. So let's jump into our, our back into our books for just a moment here. We're going to go into uh, page 84, Magnetism, and discuss, uh, discuss about it. Really, this is how, as far as uh, electricity is occur occurs or transformed or is generated, electromagnetism and magnetism is how we're able to get it completed. So I'm going to jump over here. Uh, through this a little bit. So we know by a magnet itself, it has how many poles are on a magnet? I'm on page 88. Two. Two, a north and a? South. South. Now, you can think of it in this way, just don't get your mind stuck on it. As the north is the positive side and the uh, south, south is the negative. negative side, all right? So a magnet itself does have a field of energy of magnetism that does emanate from it. If you go over to page uh, 90, figure 4-8, you'll see those fields of magnetism that emanate from a magnet and the figure down below it also that uh, emanate from a magnet. So south and north attract and uh, north and north repel, south and south repel. So like Poles repel, opposite poles attract. So remember that, okay? All right, so we're gonna go down, we're moving, I know we're moving kind of quickly here, but I'm gonna get down to the meat and potatoes of this. I'm getting down to the page of uh, 91, and I'm gonna read you about magnetic induction. Magnetic induction is one of the most important concepts in the electrical field. It is the basic operating principle underlying alternators, generators, transformers, and most alternating current motors. It is imperative that anyone desiring to work in the electric field have an understanding of the principles involved. As stated, one of the basic laws, basic laws of electricity is that whenever a current flows through a conductor, 
a magnetic field is created around the conductor. All right, highlight that, put stars around it, make sure that stays in your brains. So if I go back to here, let's see. Okay. All right, so this guy's actually doing a live line bare hand work and he's in a suit also. He's got the clamp on the conductor over here, so he's at the same charge. And to play around a little bit, he actually is gonna take the clamp off and he's gonna grab it by hand. That's a good indication there. You gotta be suited from head to toe. Now this guy who doesn't have a suit on, he cannot get involved in touching the conductor. He can take the clamp off, if the guy is holding the conductor, there, there's a little bit of teamwork that's going on here. This is 115,000 volts. Yep. Ready? Yep. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Now you hear the alarm going off in the background? Yeah, the bump bump. Yeah, the bucket will alarm. <clears throat> that's a proximity alarm. An alarm will go on off in the bucket if you start to approach a conductor that has voltage on it. And that's what's happening as soon as he's making contact right there. As soon as you're at the same potential, that alarm will go away. Now the electrostatic field, what was the voltage we were working with before? Uh, yeah. 700 something, wasn't it? So you're almost looking at six times of what we're working at right here. And you can tell by looking at it, the electrostatic field is relatively short, right? right through his hand right there, that's about all you're gonna get out of it. Now, is he feeling that? I would think so. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's definitely feeling that, but uh, he's, he's manning up to it, He wants. he's on a video. Okay. Yeah. The bucket is made out of complete aluminum, so everything's at the same potential. That's the electrostatic field. Now, how do you stop it? The electromagnetic field is relatively large, and it's going to be dependent on how much current flows through the conductor. So if I have one amp on this conductor, and you cannot see it, you cannot feel it, you can measure it with a special kind of tool, the electromagnetic field with one amp on this conductor is relatively small. All right, the more amps I add to it, what happens to the electromagnetic field? It's larger. It's larger and larger and larger the higher my current is around the conductor. It will get to the point where it can be so large, it can actually affect the other conductor way over here. You remember back in the day, I, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this, where they were saying that high voltage lines over in Germany and those areas were affecting the cows? The electromagnetic field. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, there's no really potential damage from an electromagnetic field, but uh, that that's what they're talking about. Electrostatic, relatively small, depending on voltage. Even if you went up to 765, it wouldn't be any bigger from probably right about in here down to the conductor. Electromagnetic, depending on current flow, how much current is on the conductor, can spread out you know, hundreds of feet. Robbie, anything you want to add there as far as the electromagnetic? You're muted. I got a question, sir. Hold on. Robbie, got anything? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The uh, electromagnetic field, is that going to alarm on the bucket, or are you going to feel it as you get close? Or? No. No, it's invisible. It is. Uh, there's a special tool that you can measure it with. But no, as far as they are concerned, electromagnetism is not going to affect them at all. The voltage will. But electromagnetism will not affect them or anything around them at all. Now, if you're wearing a digital watch or you got your cell phone on you, it will destroy it. Yeah. Not the electrostatic. So the only thing, 
they're worried about is the electrostatic field. Right, the electrostatic field and voltage. Okay. Okay. They're, they're not concerned of how many amps are running on the conductor or the electromagnetic field that's being emanated from it. They are concerned with voltage and electrostatic field. And there's really no concern for you out there in the world, except, and we'll get into that later when you start doing grounding, of when you're going to uh, ground because of an electromagnetic field on a potential line. So, yeah, just to give back any kind of electronics that uh, are sensitive, a cell phone, a digital watch, uh, anything like that that you have on you in this situation is pretty much going to be wiped because of the size of the electromagnetic field. Now, if there's only one amp on the conductor, you might get away with it. If there's 900, you might as well consider your cell phone or anything electronic gone. Okay. Uh, they're not allowed to carry radios. So you got it. Is it pretty, pretty much wipes out a radio too. Okay. So do we know the difference now? Can is everybody got to understand it, the difference between an electrostatic field voltage, relatively small, and it's dependent on the voltage size, and electromagnetic field. What's the electromagnetic field attribute? What makes an electromagnetic field? Amperage. Amperage. Correct. If I have zero amps on this line, there is no electromagnetic field. If I've got 500 amps on this line, the electromagnetic field is large, very large. Okay. All right. So go back. Uh, let's go into page 92. Figure 414 at the bottom. So there are ways to actually intensify my electromagnetic field. And if you look at the um, figure at the bottom of 414, as soon as I wind a conductor into a coil, I can actually intensify the size of my magnetic field. Now, the amount of coils that are, cons you know, that are added, the more coils that I have, the larger the field. This is gonna, you're still gonna need amperage. So if you look at the N side, the N plus side, if I put one amp through that and put it through one, two, three, four, five, six coils, I can intensify that uh, magnetic field by how many times? Five. How many coils do I have? Six. Six. Six, yeah. Instead of having a straight wire going all the way across, like you see this Lyman holding on to, where I have a magnetic field of intensity of one, we're not going to say amps, we're just going to say one, I can intensify my magnetic field by six if I coil my conductor up. Obviously, you've seen transformers out there the, uh, on pictures and what, the inner core of transformers. Uh, how many coils of wire do they have on them? A lot. Thousands, yeah, sometimes tens of thousands of coils on them. What they're doing in that situation there is they're making a focused mm. high magnetic field to be able to transform. All right, so down to page 93, we're still with magnetism. See the figure in 415? Okay. You've got a magnet with a north and south on it. You've got a conductor that goes to a zero center meter. What are the three things that we need to be able to create voltage, generate electricity? Uh, movement. Movement. Current and voltage. Current. Movement and current will produce what? You said it, uh, Elijah. Voltage. Voltage. There you go. So this is very simplistic in its design right here. What they're doing is they're taking this wire and moving it through the magnetic field of the north and south, up and down. And when that movement happens through the magnetic field, voltage is produced. So this is in, it, in itself is a very simple generator. Now, let me see if I got the video for it. Hold on a second. Get rid of this guy. Of the 
most important applications of the relationship between electricity and magnetism are the electric motor and the electric generator. By definition, an electric generator is a device that converts mechanical energy into electrical energy using electromagnetic induction. The reverse conversion of electrical energy into mechanical energy is done by an electric motor. This is a very simple and basic structure of an electric motor. We can see the battery, a commutator, the brushes, the copper wire loop, and the permanent magnet. The brushes are attached to a wooden support, and the commutator is fixed to the loop of copper wire. The commutator rotates freely, rubbing against the brushes. So if you notice in this picture here, and I like the way they kind of got it, I wish they would have made this in blue like this. When the battery is charging the conductor with a voltage and it's coming through here, what's the spin motion is created through the difference between north and south. You'll notice that when this thing starts spinning and he changes the direction of the battery right here, this is repelling and this is retract, uh, attracting. And through the course of the spin, through the magnet, it's doing it again and again and again. That's what's pushing this around. Not These are magnets and these are magnets also. All right, so he's making, and you'll notice there's no connection right here. He's sending an electromagnetic field through here that's pushing and that's what makes your rotation in the motor, the electromagnetic field. It's the repel and attract, repel and attract, repel and attract of both of these right here. Now when we pass current through the circuit, this creates a magnetic field around the wire, which interacts with the field of the permanent magnet to produce a rotation of the loop that looks like this. The electric motor and the electric generator are related like two sides of a coin. In general, the task of an electric motor is to convert electrical current into mechanical force. On the other hand, an electrical generator converts mechanical force into electrical current. So as you can see, we can simply rearrange our motor into a generator. In this case, we will provide the mechanical force with a windmill rotor. You still, the only reason why they moved the magnet here is to be able to get some kind of force, electromotive force onto the, uh, element right here. Uh, this is still giving off an electromagnetic field between here and here. So we got to have some kind of motor force. Think of this as a turbine, uh, a windmill, whatever you want to, to be able to start spinning this element. They're attached to the loop and connect a bulb in place of the battery. We will leave the magnetic field as it is and as the wind rotates the blade, an electrical current is produced. Okay, I'm going to show that last part again one more time. So when I start moving the blade, that's my movement part, correct? When I start taking, and remember this is magnetized, this, this, and this, and this are magnetized. When I start making the movement and start cutting the lines of the magnetic field, what gets produced? Voltage. Voltage, right. Voltage and current. Once I add this to it, once I add this to certain current is being used because I'm using current to power my light bulb. So if I provide movement of one element, positive and negatively charged through this magnet, and I go through another magnet, positive and negatively charged, as soon as that movement begins and I start, when they, they call it cutting, I start cutting the magnetic field from one element to another, electricity is produced. This is the very basic and very core of how electricity is made. So the actual energy from an electro electromagnetic field coming from here to here is being cut by this electromagnetic from here to here. And once those lines of force are cut, electricity is produced. Are there any questions there? All right. I guess if you wanted to increase the uh, 
voltage, where would you put the coils? If or is that even to increase voltage? Part? Right. So if you wanted to coil up wires, wouldn't that increase the voltage? That's going to increase your current. Current? Right. It's going to increase the size of your mag magnetic field. Uh, what, what's going to increase the voltage in my circuit right here? Wouldn't it be the revolution? The revolutions, and you got to watch out for this. We're talking DC in this moment. The revolutions will, in this instance, because we're talking DC, will increase the voltage because I'm breaking this field in a faster and faster pace. Once I start increasing the voltage, what happens to my current? Goes up, goes down. It starts to lower in that case because I'm producing a higher voltage. So that that portion of the question is correct. Remember, we're talking basic here. In a generating station generator, do you think I have a mass of giant magnets? No. no. Generating station? No. No, it's physically impossible. So making AC it is a little bit different than its concept. Still use electric. Still uses electromagnetic induction, <coughs> but the concept's a little bit different in that. Uh, what what the other things here? could affect my voltage and current. Can I get a stronger magnet? Will that affect anything? Yeah, it would. Sure. Add. So there's a lot of variables that go on in here that, that are able to uh, make this different. Uh, say if I came over here and you see the blue and the red magnet, what if I, what if I put four in there and went red, blue, red, blue, and put four, uh, four different elements in here. Instead of this one here, I put two, and they, they were kind of perpendicular to each other. Do you think that'd be more efficient? Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. You get twice the revolutions per spin, right? You get twice, the, well, you'd be cutting these lines of force double time. So you're actually able to slow down the rotation of this because you're doing double time the work with two sets of elements that are coming out of here. Okay. Any other questions on electro uh, magnetic? To be honest with you, and there there is protections against this. Let's see. Get back to this point right here. If I was to take this battery out and start spinning this element right here, would I get electricity off these two posts? Yes. Yeah. No, because it's open. Well, if I took the a current, still going to flow though, right? All right. Just not in a complete circuit. Right. Take the battery out and replace it with a light bulb, and just leave this just as it is. And uh, I'm going to take and put my hand on the thing and just spin this element as quick as I can. Will I start lighting up the light bulb? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Think of these things too in reverse. Now that doesn't mean in the real world today because there is protective measures to go against that, that I can go out to my air conditioner fan, put a drill to it and start spinning that motor and electricity is gonna come back. There are protective measures to prevent that. So that doesn't happen out there in real life and we're talking DC electricity here. So a generator and a motor are just opposites of each other. I'm introducing voltage here to make this spin, all right? I'm introducing a fan here to make it spin and it's doing just the opposite. Now it's producing voltage. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. You guys getting worn out? Be honest. I'm good. Okay. So let's X on that one. Oops, why did that happen? I got, I saw this video just because it came out there and because I like these kind of videos, they're kind of cool just to show you guys, and we'll get ready to wrap it up. What time are we holding here? 10.30. 10.30 already? 
I value target. I went rogue. Okay, so how high are we going to go? 2,000 feet. Two grand, right. Two grand. We're going up here to change the light bulb out in the tower. Now, the guy is using hooks, and these hooks are uh, to a full body harness. But as far as the OSHA standards are concerned, free climbing is allowed on a tower, and this is considered free climbing. There is no fall protection. So, do you wear a parachute? No. No, typically not. You just free climb. And this is what he's doing. I think I'd be stopping halfway up to take lunch. Uh, it usually takes, now, a lot of these uh, newer towers have an elevator in it. It'll take you halfway. When I say elevator, it's a platform that you stand on. Okay, so he's up at two grand. I don't know why I lost audio. Do you have a headache if you drop something at that height? No. <laughs> Obviously, it has to be done on a pretty non-windy day with good weather. It's well above the clouds. And you'll see plenty of times, I mean, I've got another video and I'll probably clue you guys into it. It's called Stairway to Heaven, Tower Climbing. Uh, you can pretty much stand on this thing and freehand it. I mean, if you have a fall from here, it's definitely gonna be catastrophic. <laughs> I would think so. Yeah. But he's gonna have to use two hands while he's working up here and that is his safety. So his safety is hooked onto what? Yeah. The rung? Yeah, the rung. That's it. And, uh, yeah, it can slide off the rung here. So who's interested in tower climbing? Me? Uh, I think I'll stick to the pole. You think you'll stick to the pole? Um, yeah. I did have a class that came out there. I think it was the third class that I had. So we're looking the first semester about five years ago. That crossed the highway at HPC that was doing tower climbing over there. That guy came over and hired 12 right out of the class immediately. Guess how much he paid them? A good bit. $1 a foot. So if you climb so it. If you climbed a, a two thousand foot tower and you changed out a light bulb and you came back down, how did you make? How much did you make for that job? Four grand. Two grand. Two grand. Four grand. My goodness. What? You don't get paid for the trip down? Yeah, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> you slow, that one's gonna be free. Yeah. Job done make, at that point, right? I gotta make it back down, don't I? <laughs> Yeah, you got I mean, job's done. <laughs> but uh, if you ever think about, I mean, of course, this is extreme. I think this is probably one of the tallest one in the United States. Uh, there are definitely short towers around. When I say short towers, uh, 60, 70, 80 towers, you ever think of the tower climbing industry? They are looking for a lot of people out there, out there in the world. Once again, it's another traveling job. You go from tower to tower to tower to tower. 
to be able to do tower work. Yeah, but how often are you actually climbing towers? Oh, every day. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got you got the boss, man. You got the company that's in front of you that has got already got jobs lined up for the week. Is that would that say like like around you know, like HTC around here? Would that be like local or you like travel out of state for that? You you're not gonna find very many utilities now back. Uh, Robbie probably attested this probably from the days that he worked. Santee Cooper had its own all of its own communications. It was internal to the company, so we had all our own radio towers. The linemen were tasked with going up those towers. The tallest tower I've been up on is uh, 1,286 feet. So we had to do all of our own tower work. Well, that lasted maybe 10 years, and then, then they went to contracting it. So contracting work and contract work saves a lot of money for a utility. And, uh, you know, you, you really, any utility, you don't want to be somebody that's going to, that's going to do a task maybe once or twice every year. You need to be a contractor for that. We, we never did any tower work. They, they quit that year before I started. Yeah. Now, transmission, on the other hand, if you're working on transmission crew, uh, those, those can span one to 200, so I see some 200 foot steel poles that you're going to have to climb. If you're going to transmission, those are kind of stout. All right, I think we've got a good concept of what, and what we wanted to learn today was about electrostatic charge, electrostatic fields, and electromagnetic and electromagnetic fields. I think that's Robbie, unless you have anything else, you have anything else for today? I think I have good coverage. Okay. Yep. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and throw a quiz on today. It's looking like the weather is not going to cooperate. It's pouring rain down here. I don't know where you're at, Robbie. Yep. Okay. So I will throw a quiz on. I'll let you know when it's uh, prepared for this afternoon. It'll just go over. What we discussed uh, this morning, you know, I might throw in there a couple of FR questions. There you go. About Mr. Hopkins' safety uh, meeting and uh, the WF. Good grief. Who flushed the toilet? There. Out there? There. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll keep an eye on it and let you guys know what you're doing tomorrow. Uh, did everybody get the text that I got? the information from Mr. Mark Jones. Yeah, he just sent me an email. Okay. Yeah, me too. Okay, so everybody get that squared away. If uh, that business is between you and him, everybody does have his information, correct? That's what you make. Yeah, if you need his contact information, text me on Remind, let me know, and I can send that to you just in case he has not contacted you yet. Can you all hear me? Right. Yeah, so I, I, the VA is supposed to pay for mine, and uh, I reached out when, when he first came to the field, um, and then I reached out to Benita and Wendy, the VA rep, and I got an email back from her, uh, from Benita, saying that you might know how that gets paid. I got a purchase order that they said um, that includes the gear, but I'm not sure how the college pays for it. You know anything about that? No. I've never had the college pay for it. The VA's always pay for it. Okay. So I'll, I'll just I'll reach back out to them and say that. Yeah, yeah. And what typically happens from the ones that I've seen before is that when you got your invoice, you needed to send a copy of your invoice into the VA, and the VA in turn would uh, cut a check for that amount. Okay. Okay. All right, gentlemen, with that, I'm going to shut it down. Uh, I'll post when the video is complete and up there on the website, on, the, on YouTube, and I also will post when the quiz is uh, ready for today, okay? Easy enough. You're right, man. Any other questions for today? With that, gentlemen, have a good one. Be safe. Williams. Have a good one. Take it easy. All right, man. Hey, do I need to do my generation meter project like with everybody in the class or just y'all? No, uh, us is fine. I mean, you want me to go ahead and do it now while I'm already on here?
Yeah, sure. Let me bring it up. Okay. Well, I got it. I can just share on my screen if you want to. Oh, that's fine. Looks like Matthew fell asleep. Yeah. If you give me just a moment, well, Robbie, you can watch this. Yeah. But we'll run out and do something here real quick. Put some clothes on, dude. <laughs> wow. Huh? Wow. How do I? How do I share the screen? Oh, I see it. Can you see that? I see Superman. Okay. Can you see me or just do you see the screen? I got both of you. Okay. All right, so how you want me to do it? Just read off the slides or is that how you? Yeah, that's right. All right, well, this is the Generation of Meter project for me. All right, um, this is the start of the generating station and I've got the, the three um, generators, arrows to them right there. But uh, the generating stations or power plants use fossil fuels and other materials and create electricity by turning turbines. Uh, the typical fuel for a power plant would be coal, natural gas, or nuclear power. Uh, the step up transformer, and I've got it circled right there. Um, a step up transformer is used when you need to take lower voltage and increase it to a higher level voltage. Uh, step up transformer is being used in this case to increase the voltage because of the long distance travel. Very good. Transmission lines. Uh, switch yard. <laughs> the main function of a switch yard is to transmit and distribute the power at an incoming voltage from the generating station and provi provide facilities and companies the option of switching them on and off. Mm -hmm. A uh, switch yard is the point in the power network where transmission lines and distribution feeders are connected through circuit breakers. Okay. Uh, the transmission line. Transmission lines are specialized lines that are used to carry high voltage across long distances. Uh, transmission lines are typically carrying a lot higher voltage due to the energy loss of long distance travel. And I just, I found this on Google. I don't know how or how it works, but it said air acts as the wires insulator. There's no insulators on those transmission lines, it's just air. No, that's, yeah, there's, there's, well, on the towers there's insulators, but yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, substation, a substation is a high voltage electric system facility. It's used to switch generators, equipment, and circuits or lines in and out of the system. It's also used to change AC voltages from one level to another. Let's see, hold on one second. So I'm gonna, uh, to look at All right, where's your um, where's your substation transformer? Say again. Which one is your substation transformer? It's the one right here on the right in the picture. Yeah, back there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can see my mouse too, right? Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Um. A bus bar, uh, an electric power distribution, a bus bar is a metallic strip or bar typically housed inside switch gear, panel boards, and busway enclosures for local high current power distribution. And I'm, I'm assuming basically um, with a bus bar, is, is it basically just a long conductor you can hook any switch or anything you want to up to it, correct? Yeah, well, it's used to um, like, and there's three kinds of bus bar. You remember what those three are? Oh, I, I remember you talking about them. I don't remember the right mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Yeah, and you'll see this again. It's, it's tubular strain, which is like the conductor itself. Mm -hmm. And then it's flat bars. Flat bars, yep. Yeah, and it's just used to uh, move uh, voltage and current from like the transformer down to the breaker itself. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, the breaker. Um, a circuit breaker in a distribution substation basically helps keep the circuit safe from higher loads and can also aid blocking off a single part of a circuit if needed to be de-energized for any reason. Okay. Is that a, is that a distribution breaker there or is that a um, transmission breaker? That's a distribution breaker. That's yeah. a transmission. Is that right? No, that's a, that would be a transmission breaker there. That's a big one. And what's, oh, because of the higher, higher loads? The, yes, see how big the bushes are. Big, I mean, yeah, the bushes are bigger. Yeah, yeah. I see, if I see another one, huh? If I see another one in in, in your slide presentation, I'll show you what I, I think is. Hold on, 
Right. Let's see. I think in the switch yard. Hold on. Is that one back there in that back right hand corner right there? It that's would be, yeah, be about that same size. That's correct. Okay. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Voltage regulator. Voltage regulators can be found both at substations and out on the distribution lines to help maintain a constant voltage level along the entire feeder. They're used especially on extra long distribution feeders. Okay. Uh, the feeder lines. Feeders are the power lines through which electricity is transmitted in power systems. Feeder transmits power from the generating stations or substations to the distribution points. Uh, feeder lines are most seen on the major highways and other places and are just another form of a transmission line. Way smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, way smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A fuse tap, a fuse tap or a fuse cutout uh, is a combination of a fuse and a switch used in primary overhead feeder lines and is used to protect transformers from current surges and overloads. And uh, how it works is if an overcurrent is caused by a fault in the transformer or customer circuit will cause the fuse to melt, disconnect in the transformer from the line. Okay. Uh, solid tap, I've got it circled in that picture there, but a solid tap is connecting your primary wire to a secondary wire running to something different. I mean, I, and I said, yeah, it works, but there's no fuse providing any protection between the two connections. That's right. It's just a tap off the line. Right. Uh, the step down transformer, and I got it, sir. I, I guess I'm retarded. I can't circle in a, the right thing, but uh, yeah. step up transformer. The transformer is changing the voltage, but in this case, it's taking a higher voltage and dropping it, the voltage to a useful level for whatever the case. Um, in this case, it'd be using it to power a home. Okay. So dropping it from 7200 to 240. Right. Um, a secondary line. Secondary line is a low voltage line used to carry electricity from distribution transformers to a home where a service line can be ran for the customer. Uh, usually these lines don't ever exceed more than 240 volts. Oh, residential. Residential. Yeah. So if it was, so there's residential and what else? You got commercial, residential, industrial. I mean, you got those three, and there's all kinds of voltages out there, 480, um, straight 240, 208, okay. 600 volts. There's all kinds of secondary voltage out there. So 240 be kind of residential. Yeah, 120, 240, that's correct. Okay. Uh, service lines. Service lines are run from the main power supply to the meter in your home, building, or other structure. They can also be ran underground depending on the conditions and the customer's preference. That is correct. Um, and the meter, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory really, but a meter is used to measure the amount of, I'm pretty sure Shoemaker said amperage, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Went into your home and uh, this sort of service line coming from the main power supply connects and powers your home. Right. Right. Okay. Good, good. I mean, is there any problems? No, I didn't see any problems with that. They okay. look real good. Professor Shoemaker? You want to look good. Yeah. You want to go back through it? No, no, no. no. Okay. You're good. You good? Yep. Thank you all. Thank you for doing it. All right, man. Have a go. Good grief. Take that off your screen. <laughs> what? Stupid, <laughs> hey, man. Good Lord. <laughs> all right, man. All right, man. We'll see.